All right, here are solutions to problem 50, what is this, 7 off the GRE subject, uh, math practice test. Okay, so what we have here is we're defining this sequence xn, and we're not really even defining it. We're just saying that uh, the nth term in this sequence falls in the open interval from 0 to 1 over n. So the first term in this sequence is some number between 0 and 1. I don't know what number. Maybe it's a third. Maybe it's 1 over pi. Maybe it's some other number you can think of that's between 0 and 1. I don't know what it is. That's the first term in this sequence. The second term in this sequence is some number, I don't know what the hell it is, between 0 and 1 half. The third, some number between 0 and 1 third. The fourth, some number between 0 and 1 fourth, and so on. So that's already kind of challenging, right? You have XM, but you don't really have a concrete idea of what the hell it is. And we're going to be doing some pretty complicated stuff with that as this problem goes on. Uh, but that's the idea of XN. This first statement, the limit as n approaches infinity of XN equals 0. You're like, yeah, that makes sense, right? If n gets really, really large, then the term xn is some unknown value between 0 and 1 over some really, really, really large number here. 1 over some really, really large number is some number that's damn near 0. So I'm picking some number between 0 and something that's damn near 0. Intuitively, it seems like this limit equals 0. That ends up being true. You probably don't like that intuitive explanation. So what you can do is you can cite this thing called the squeeze theorem. And the idea of the squeeze theorem is if I can create two other sequences, so maybe I'll call them AN and BN, and AN is always less than this guy and BN is always greater than this guy, then the limit of XN will always be some number that is greater than or equal to this limit and less than or equal to this limit. So let me define these and show you what the hell I'm doing here. AN equals zero. Wait, I thought this was a sequence. Yeah, it's a sequence and it's always equal to zero. The first term is zero, the second term is zero, the third term is zero, and so on. What's the limit here? Well, fairly obvious. The limit as n approaches infinity of this thing, a n would be equal to zero, duh. Uh, b n, I'm gonna define this thing to be one over n. Uh, one over n is probably a sequence that you're fairly familiar with. The limit as n approaches infinity of b n will be equal to zero. So what I have here are two sequences, and what I want you to notice is that an is always going to be less than xn, because an is always 0, and xn is always some number between 0 and 1 over n. It's always a positive number, so xn is always bigger than an for any value n. Any term n I look at, the xn term will be bigger than the an term. And similarly, xn is always less than bn, because bn is always 1 over n, which is the upper limit here. Remember, xn, you're choosing some number between 0 and 1 over n. So the 12th term, x12, is some number between 0 and 1 12th. The 12th term here is 0. The 12th term here is 1 12th. The 12th term here, I don't know what the hell it is, but I know it's some number between 0 and 1 12th, not including those endpoints. Note that xn would be between an and bn. But wait a minute. What this is telling me about the limit as n approaches infinity of xn is that it must be greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0. The only number that is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0 is the number 0. Therefore, this limit equals 0. Sorry for beating that to death. I probably could have done that in 30 seconds, and I just wasted uh, some amount of your life on that. 3 minutes and 40 seconds. Okay, the second one here. If f is a continuous real-valued function defined on 0, 1. Okay, so far I'm good. It's a continuous function. I know what that means. It's a real-valued function. Okay, so far so good. Defined on 0, 1. Okay, so I'm only allowed to put zeros and 1s into this function. I guess I can deal with that. Uh, then, oh, it looks like I'm creating another sequence here. I'm creating a sequence here, and the elements in this sequence are the outputs of this function when the inputs of this function are exactly this sequence up here. Okay, so I can kind of wrap my head around this sequence. There's some function. I don't know what the hell the function is, but what I'm doing to figure out the first term of this sequence is I'm taking the first term of this sequence, xn, which, remember, we don't know the first term of this sequence. It's just some number between 0 and 1. But we're taking that number and we're putting it into this unknown function f. Wow, this is getting confusing. Uh, and that gives me some other value, which will be the first term of this sequence right here. And what I'm asked, I mean, it's hard just to wrap your head around what the hell that means. I'm asked, is that thing Cauchy? And unfortunately, Cauchy, you might not know off the top of your head what the hell that means. I didn't. I don't remember what the hell Cauchy was. I had to go look that up. I kind of had a vague idea. It had something to be something like convergent, but uh, it's some special case that takes care of these weird cases. 
Okay, here's what Cauchy means. Um, informally, a sequence is Cauchy if its elements get arbitrary close to each other as the sequence progresses. So when I get really, really far in this sequence, when I look at the one millionth and the one, the, when I look at the terms after the one millionth, then what will happen is any two terms after the one millionth will be really close to each other. And one millionth is just some number that I made up. There's no special significance to one million. I'm just trying to represent some arbitrary number. More formally, mathematically, it says, go ahead and pick an epsilon. Pick some super small number. I don't care what the hell you pick. Pick your epsilon. You got it? Pick some epsilon in your head, some number that is greater than zero and presumably really, really small. 0 0.00000001, fine. You got your number. What I can do is I can pick some natural number. I can pick some index, maybe the one millionth term. And what will happen is that any two terms in my sequence after the millionth term, so maybe the one millionth and twentieth and the two millionth, those two guys right there, the difference between those terms will be less than your value epsilon. And that'll be true for any two after the one millionth term or whatever n is equal to. That's what Cauchy means. You're like, whoa, that's a lot like convergent, right? Well, yes and no. Um, convergent implies Cauchy. If you have a convergent sequence, it's guaranteed to be Cauchy. And maybe you can talk your head around, talk yourself why that's true. The one that's a little bit weird is that Cauchy does not imply convergent. Wait, what? why would Cauchy not imply convergent? Well, it's kind of a special case that can be really frustrating. Um, Cauchy only implies convergent if your metric space is complete. So what a complete metric space is, is one that informally here contains its limits. So for example, the real numbers between zero and one is not, whoa, is not complete. Let me get that back. Uh, and the reason why, let's write it like this. And the reason why is I could define some sequence. In fact, I already have defined a sequence. Uh, let's let, well, I've almost, how about I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say the real numbers between 0 and 2 uh, intersect R. Intersect R, that seems weird. Let's just say the real numbers from 0 to 2, and you can imply that I'm talking about the real numbers right there. Um, this is not complete. And this is not complete because of my sequence. I think I called it BN, this guy right here. Note that every term in this sequence will be a real number between 0 and 2. The first term is a 1, the second term is a 1 half, then a 1 third, then a 1 fourth, and so on. All right, so every term in my sequence is in this space. However, its limit is 0, and 0 is not in this space. So if I asked you, is this sequence right here convergent? You might say yes, but you'd be wrong. Because we can't just say a sequence is convergent. A sequence is con to, to de determine whether a sequence is convergent, you got to know what metric space you're talking about. And maybe you'd be implying we're on the real numbers, in which case, sure, it's convergent right here. But if we're not on the real numbers, if our metric space is just the numbers from 0 to 2, for example, it's not convergent because it converges, in quotation marks there, to 0. But 0 is not an element of my metric space. So it converges to some non-existent spot, it's not convergent right there. You're know, like, that's a pretty stupid case. That feels like this thing should always be convergent, but it ends up being important that it's not convergent on certain spaces. So in order to accommodate for that kind of stupid difference, we have to term, define this term Cauchy. And that's the difference between convergent and Cauchy. Because I'm here, it kind of maybe an interesting example is the limit as in, or not even the limit. How about let's define CN maybe as 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power. Um, is this thing right here convergent? Trick question. I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, that's convergent. As n approaches infinity, this thing goes to e, right? Yeah, I remember that from a class. That's definitely convergent. We'll be careful. Convergent is dependent upon your metric space. So if my metric space is the rational numbers, note that every term in this sequence is a rational number. The first term is 2 to the first power, 1 plus 1 over 1. That's rational. The second term is 1 plus 1 half to the second power. So that's what, 3 halves squared, which is 9 fourths. That's rational, and so on. Every term in this sequence is rational, but its limit is e, which is an irrational number. So if I restrict myself to just the rational numbers, this guy would not be convergent. However, it is still Cauchy. The nice thing is that the real number, that these two things are the same if your metric space is complete, which makes sense, right? If your metric space contains all of its limits, 
then what that means is that any sequence like this in my metric space, its limit, E in this case, is also in that metric space. So if I pick a metric space that has that quality, then Cauchy and conversion are the exact same thing. Good news, the real numbers are complete. Any sequence you make of real numbers um, converges, that converges, converges to an element in the real numbers. Right? You can't have a bunch of real numbers that converge to some complex number, for example. The real numbers are complete. So what that means is that for the sake of this problem, anytime a metric space is the real numbers, I can use Cauchy and convergent interchangeably. Wow, that's a lot of talking about Cauchy and convergent. I don't even remember where I left off to tell you the truth. Oh, right, a Cauchy sequence. Well, I'm talking about a real valued function. So as long as I'm talking about a real valued function, really I can just think that Cauchy means the exact same as convergent. So can I come up with a function that would create a sequence here that would not be convergent? And it turns out that I can. Uh, this is a false statement. And a counterexample that I could use would be uh, maybe up here. F of x is equal to the sine of 1 over x. So this is a counterexample that you see all the time in topology. It's an interesting case, I guess. Uh, what's going on here is that as x gets really, really close to 0, note that, note first of all that this is a continuous function, and it is def it's continuous on 0, 1. Right? Any number between 0 and 1, this thing right here is continuous. But when my x value gets really, really close to 0, this number, the input into the sine function, gets arbitrary la arbitrarily large. So the sine of some big number, well, it's just oscillating up and down between negative 1 and positive 1. What's going on is this function looks something, there's a horrible drawing of it, like this. Well, I'm just making it worse. I should stop. Fine. The point is, when it gets close to 0 here, it just bounces up and down infinitely many times as much as you want. But it's still continuous. Yeah, there's some discontinuity at 0. That's fine. But it's continuous on 0, 1. And my claim is that if I define this sequence with this function, it will not be convergent. And that kind of makes sense if you think about what xn was. xn is this sequence that I don't know a whole lot about, but I know that the terms in xn are getting closer and closer to 0. All right, so as they get closer and closer to 0, this thing is oscillating crazy up and down all over the place. Um, if it's oscillating all up and down all over the place, then it's not even convergent. If it's not convergent, it's not Cauchy. This is a false statement here. Third statement. This one drove me kind of crazy. It made me look up some words that I didn't remember. Uniformly continuous. Is that the super continuous one? That's how I remembered it anyways. Yes, it is. What's going on here is kind of similar. What I'm doing this time is I'm taking this familiar xn sequence, but now it's the outputs from the function g. So at this xn sequence, it's still a little bit cloudy, but I'm finally starting to wrap my head around it. I'm taking each of those terms and I'm putting them into this function g, which I don't know a whole lot about. All I know is it's uniformly continuous. And the outputs from that function define another sequence. And my question is, does that new sequence have a limit that exists, aka, is it convergent? Well, note that this is a real valued function. Uh, so therefore, convergent is the same as Cauchy. So if I felt like it, I could translate this question here into asking me, so this is three maybe, is um, g of xn Cauchy? I guess I should put these weird squiggly brackets here. Is that Cauchy? That's the question it is asking me. Note that I know that xn is Cauchy. Uh, so I do know that this is true. How do I know that xn is Cauchy? Uh, I guess that goes back to statement one here. We figured out that this sequence is convergent. It converges to zero. And since we're dealing with the real numbers here, uh, or, uh, no, not even because of that, uh, convergent always implies Cauchy. Convergent always implies Cauchy. So from part one, I got that xn is Cauchy. And so the question is, is uniform continuity enough to guarantee that g of a Cauchy sequence is itself Cauchy?
That's what I'm really trying to figure out in part three here. And it'll turn out that that's true. Uh, maybe we need a little refresher on what uniform continuity is. I think about uniform continuity as kind of super continuous. So for continuous, the idea is that um, you could pick some epsilon, some super small epsilon. For any epsilon, I can find some delta such that for one given point, so really this is continuity at a point. The way you define continuity is you pick on one point. Let's make sure that my function is continuous at the point one third, fine. You pick an epsilon specific to one third, and I can find a delta so that any time I am picking an x value that is within delta of this value one third, the output of the function will be guaranteed to be within your epsilon of the output of, of g of one third. So that's kind of what continuity means. Um, uniform continuity says not only can you do that for a given x naught, but I can't find a delta for you pick an epsilon, I could find a delta that will work for any x value at once. So really what's going on is my delta is no longer depend, dependent upon the point that I'm talking about. I'm continuous on all the numbers. I'm sort of checking them all at once as opposed to the idea you check continuity one x value at a time and then your function is continuous if it's continuous at all of the infinitely many points. Uh, so that's what uniform continuity gives more mathematically. It says that for all epsilon, epsilon greater than zero, so you're picking this, I can find a delta greater than zero such that for any two x values, I know it's annoying that there's an x and a y here, for any two x values, if those two x values are within delta of each other, then it's guaranteed that the output of these functions will be within epsilon of each other. That's what uniform continuity means. What I did here is I rewrote what we know. Remember, we know this first statement. And this third statement is part three. Right? We know that xn is Cauchy. We want to know if g of xn is Cauchy. If g of xn is Cauchy, we're done with this problem. Because, where am I? If g of xn is Cauchy, then it's convergent, and therefore this limit exists, and I'm done with this problem. So that's really what I'm trying to figure out, because I have this real valued function I'm trying to figure out is g of xn Cauchy. So g of xn is Cauchy, if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists some value n such that any two times n and m are greater than n, g of xm minus g of xn is less than epsilon. It's the same thing that I have here, uh, except I plugged in, instead of my sequence being xn, I use g of xn over here. So that was that's what it means to be Cauchy. Just copy that directly from this definition here. Um, xn is Cauchy, so therefore I know, and then I can copy this definition right here. And if you're watching really carefully, you'd be like, wait a minute, you didn't copy that definition right there. Instead of saying for all epsilon greater than zero, this stuff happens. You said for all delta greater than zero. Right, that's just some placeholder. Don't worry about that. For any small number, which I'm gonna choose to call delta, so that I'm using the same variables when I talk about uniform continuity. For any delta, you go ahead and pick delta. Pick whatever the hell delta you want. For all delta greater than zero, there exists an n, there exists some value, such that any two terms in my sequence after the x capital nth term are guaranteed to be within delta of each other. Okay, so let's go through and play this game. You are first going to choose epsilon. Right? G of x n is Cauchy if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists some magical value n such that any two terms in the sequence after the nth term will guarantee that g of those two terms in the sequence are within epsilon of each other. So you're going to go ahead and pick that epsilon. You got your epsilon? Good. Okay, what I am going to do is of uniform continuity. For all epsilon greater than zero, namely that one that you just picked, I can find a delta greater than zero. So I can find this guy such that uh, for any xm, xn, if the xm and xnth term are within delta of each other, then the g of xm and g of xn are within epsilon each other. The nth and nth term here in this sequence are within epsilon of each other. So what we're saying is for the epsilon that you chose, I can find a delta so that if these two guys are within delta of each other, I get what I want. So there is some delta so that if these two guys are within delta of each other, I would be done with the problem. Then the question becomes, can I get these two guys right here within delta of each other? 
right? If that's true, then I have this hypothesis that I need, which proves this, which gives me this, which answers the question. Can I get xm minus, or xm and xn to be within delta of each other? Yeah, I can. How do I know that? Because the sequence xn is Cauchy. So for any delta greater than zero, there exists some value n such that the xm and n, xn term are within delta of each other. So what this is giving me is some special value n here. And if I use this special value n, then xm and xn are within delta of each other. And because I'm uniformly continuous, if xm and xn are within delta of each other, then g of xm and g of xn are within epsilon of each other. So for this special n, these two guys are within epsilon of each other. Wait a minute, you're telling me that there's an n that will make these two guys be within epsilon of each other? That's exactly what it means for this guy to be Cauchy. If there exists an n that makes these two guys within epsilon of each other, I'm done. So if xn is Cauchy and g is uniformly continuous, I have that g of xn must be Cauchy, which is awesome because now I'm finally done with this stupid problem. If xn is Cauchy, it is convergent. Um, if this thing is convergent, the limit exists. Therefore, this right here is a true statement. One and three are both true. The answer is C.